I've become absolutely obsessed with these things. There are so many of these rectangle things everywhere, every new building. There, they're subtle. They're there. Right over there. They're everywhere. There. Okay, this isn't a fancy apartment building, but look at this. Coles. Look at all those. If you're living in an apartment anywhere from Minneapolis to Massachusetts, you'll see a pattern of rectangles on the facade, just like this. Buildings used to look like this. Now they look like this. But all these rectangles and textures are surface evidence of a hidden system that's changed buildings. Whether it's a big public development, like a library, or private development, like an apartment building, you can find panels that compose the facade. I'm Matt Hogan, and I'm a project architect with Walter Parks Architects. And I'm Walter Parks, and I work at Walter Parks Architects yeah. with Matt. <laughs> so this building is in a old and historic district, and so it has to fit in with the historic nature of the other buildings. And if you look at that building and you look at the building behind you, there's a band, the building behind you at the top of every window. And we have a band at the top of every window. The running bond pattern mimics the bricks. We're developing a palette of exterior materials that complement one another, but also hopefully relate in some way to the neighborhood that the building's in. My name is Andrea Quilici and I am a senior associate at Queen Evans Architects and I'm a designer. Uh, I mostly work on libraries. There are three projects that we design at Queen Evans. So Libby Mill is located right at the center of a new development. We use terracotta, we use high performance concrete panels. So that looks like concrete. Verina is very pastoral, it is open, it is, you know, next to a beautiful creek that it's preserved. And then we get to Fairfield. This is much more suburban. We want to select a material that in some way resonates with this community. We want to have a material durable and we use the uh, slate because it's a material that it's everybody knows. The visual choices are different, but these panels all serve a similar technical purpose. And they're all only available now because of the evolution of building design during the 20th century. A number of trends have driven us towards actually building car dealership and high-rise apartment buildings in the same way that we built houses in 1920. My name is John Straub, and I'm a professor at the University of Waterloo in both the Department of Civil Engineering and the School of Architecture. A lot of serious houses that were meant to be permanent uh, before 1900 would have been built out of masonry, out of brick on brick. They would have had plaster as an interior finish. Brick is great, like a big sponge, but it's super heavy and requires the expense of a mason. Those 1920 houses represented a different approach by using shingles that protected the house from water but weren't necessary to hold it up. By the time we got to the Second World War, even serious houses, the houses for the town physician uh, or mayor, were now being built out of wood framing, lightweight systems. If I were to go and say, how did we build a local school or community center in 1940 or even 1960, the answer would have been masonry. But at the same time, even big projects were slowly shifting to lighter, more flexible systems. And as we got into the energy crisis, we even started to care about their energy efficiency uh, of how much it would cost to heat and cool them. I'm the Associate Director of the Pennsylvania Housing Research Center. We are a part of Penn State University in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Our core vision is rooted in Pennsylvania. It's to help that industry build better homes. By making our buildings more energy efficient, th there was a, a bit of a lag in how we controlled moisture. That is where the panels come in. They're part of a system called rain screen cladding. It takes these high-tech insulated houses and adds an air gap between them and a rain screen 
often the fiber cement panels that are so recognizable, but other textures too. It doesn't support the whole structure. That's what the frame is for. Imagine hanging a picture a half inch out from the wall. Panels are simply hung on a track system, as this installation video from one popular manufacturer, Nichiha, shows. That rain screen keeps a lot of water out, and what water does get through has time and space to dry in the gap, instead of getting in the structure and rotting it, just like those New England shingles did. Rain screen cladding keeps water out, but does it also use airflow to create a more environmentally efficient enclosure? The, creating the airflow uh, to make it more efficient is it, 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 it's, it's like vast, like it's literally nothing. It's a bee fired in a windstorm. But I would say that there's a couple of factors where depending on how you look at it, the environment, when I said that there's this trend to make, to use lighter weight, uh, less material, that is actually environmental. I mean, if you were to try and build the buildings that are needed in the next 30 years around the world and make them out of as many tons of material as we built them in 1940, the planet would just fall apart. A rain screen is nothing more than a concept, really. It's, it's a system. It's not any one product. It's not any one um, technique. It's, it's an assembly. And that can be applied to commercial buildings just as much as it can be applied to, to residential buildings. This technical adjustment and shift in thinking led to a big change in what the outside of a building could look like. I mean, there was a time where environmentally conscious building was, was sort of on the fringe. And now I think because so many of these strategies have be, like rain screens, for instance, have become more mainstream, they're seen as best practice. Our clients are mostly build and hold guys. They're long-term guys who want to hold that asset and don't want it falling apart. They're really worried about what it's going to be in 20 years. They've got a you know 25-year mortgage or 30-year mortgage. One of the key factors is, for example, the construction time. What's interesting, for example, with this system is the fact that you can enclose the building, dry in the building, independently from the facade. So certainly availability of labor is a big one. Cost is a big one as well. It has structural implications as also. When you look at designing the structure of the home, adding brick will change some of your details. Um, it will require some addi additional structural design. Easy to overcome, but any of those additional details, they start to add up. You see, if we think about the historic choices architects had in 1960, to pick another date, they didn't have a lot. It was stucco or it was brick. Uh, and then they had this sudden shock that they could do things like concrete. <laughs> and they had like, for their choices, they were like, their minds were just exploding about the possibilities. That obviously could completely turn on his head today because somewhere from the 1960s to the 2020s, we've gone to having maybe three or four dominant cladding types for walls to having easy 40 or 50. <laughs>